It's a real pleasure to be here for this public lecture. Uh, this is my fifth law school in two and a half weeks, and I have given a variety of public lectures at the other law schools. Uh, I do want to preface what I'm about to say, however, by saying, knowing who some of the people are in this particular audience, some of you are not going to be very happy, perhaps, <laughs> with what I'm going to say, and some of you in your own writings and judgments have made significant contributions to the topic I'm going to be talking about and to my own thinking about it. And more will be revealed about that as I progress. But indeed, I'm going to talk about conscience in equity, a new utopia. And it sounds quite a good title. And I was prompted to give that title because this is exactly the 500th anniversary of the publication of Sir Thomas More's book, Utopia, published in 1516. A book which is pretty hard going, but in that book, More identifies this perfect community. A community where law is incredibly important, where equity is incredibly important. There's an awful lot of legal discourse and references to the language of equity and justice and fairness that characterizes Moore's utopia. So this is really perhaps an opportunity to reflect on equity in the 21st century. And I'm very conscious that I'm standing in New Zealand as an English lawyer, but actually talking about equity here I think is appropriate. Equity is important in New Zealand. You have developed equity in your own image to some extent. But an awful lot of the language and the ideas and the underlying principles do derive from English law. So this is a really good topic to look at what's going on in New Zealand and what is going on in England as well. And obviously the focus is on conscience. Because when I teach equity to my students back in Cambridge, I say, Conscience is right at the heart of equity. The language of conscience and unconscionability. That's the sort of thing we say readily. I say that in my textbook. There are many judgments which say the similar idea. Conscience is at the heart of equity. The problem is, what do we actually mean by conscience? And what do we mean by unconscionability. Now, in the course of this presentation, I am going to be, I am afraid, slightly rude about New Zealand law and legal practice. Don't be too offended, I'm going to be much ruder about what's going on in England, <coughs> where frankly I think the English judges and quite a few commentators have completely lost the plot. But, I think it's appropriate for me to be challenging, but not to be disrespectful. And actually, rereading Thomas More's Utopia, I did find this quotation, which gives me a bit of heart in what I'm about to say. He said, you are not obliged to assault people with discourses that are out of their road when you see that their received notions must prevent your making an impression upon them. You ought rather to cast about and to manage things with all the dexterity in your power, so that if you are not able to make them go well, they may be as little ill as possible. So if this doesn't go well, I hope it, there is as little ill as possible arising from what I'm going to say. Now, what is the nature of the problem? 
the language of conscience and unconscionability is used a great deal both in England and you can find it in New Zealand cases as well. And as I said earlier, what exactly does conscience mean? Now my thoughts relating to this and that this is a, a problem that requires careful consideration was prompted by two decisions of the UK Supreme Court in 2013 given within two weeks of each other when the language of conscience and unconscionability was used but was interpreted completely differently. Now the first case is Pitt and Holt, the facts of which don't matter for today but it was a case about a settlement on trust which the set law sought to challenge and set aside on the ground of mistake. Essentially she had been advised to set up the trust in a particular way to avoid a significant tax liability. The legal advice was not very good and actually was set up in a way to incur a particular tax liability and she sought to get the settlement set aside to avoid the tax liability. And actually the Supreme Court allowed that settlement to be set aside. But in that case, Lord Walker said an important test of the equitable jurisdiction to set aside for mistake is whether not setting it aside would result in an awful word he used, but would not result in unconscionableness. That was the standard. And he said the standard of unconscionableness was an objective standard. And to determine it, you have regard to the circumstances of the mistake, the consequences, change of position, and other met matters relevant to the exercise of the courts. And I should say there is a typo in that slide, and it should say the court's discretion. That's going to prove important a little bit later. So the test for the jurisdiction to set aside was one of unconscionableness objectively defined. Two weeks later, in a case which made no reference to Pitt and Holt, maybe because the facts were significantly different, Lord Newberger used the language of conscience to establish a liability, but interpreted it very differently. This was the Vestergaard case, a case which was about accessorial liability for breach of confidence. Uh, the breach of confidence related to trade secrets relating to a mosquito net which had got uh, a particular drug put into the netting to keep the mosquitoes away. The question of liability related to somebody who had arguably assisted the breach of confidence and it was held she would only be liable if she acted unconscionably. But here, unconscionable was interpreted subjectively, with a focus on the defendant's state of mind and with particular regard to issues of knowledge, willful blindness, recklessness and dishonesty. Two cases of the Supreme Court within a fortnight, using the language of conscience and unconscionability, but interpreted very differently. Pitt and Holt objective. Vestergaard, a subjective test of fault. So what on earth is going on? Can we really use the same words and interpret them so differently? Now let's just focus briefly on the language of conscience and unconscionability. This is largely a, a ground-clearing exercise, just so you're all with me about the basic language. 
My view is that we can actually use conscience and unconscionability interchangeably in the sense that they are different sides of the same coin. My view is that unconscionability means contrary to good conscience. That's the negative and good conscience the positive. In the cases and the commentaries, you'll find many synonyms for unconscionability. It's bad faith or equitable fraud or injustice, unfairness, dishonesty and commercially unacceptable conduct. They are used both in New Zealand and in England as synonyms for the language of unconscionability. And the real question is, when we use that word unconscionable, should it refer, does it refer, to a state of mind, a normative standard for evaluating conduct? Is it a test of morality, a sense of guilt, or all of those things? And I'm going to investigate that in a minute. But I just want to say two things before I go any further. First is just to establish that in New Zealand, the language of unconscionability has been interpreted. You'll see there in the, the judgment of Justice Summers in the Elders case, as say, he said that words such as unconscionable and inequitable have drawn closer to more objective concepts, such as fair, reasonable and just. That's one of those uh, uh, dictums that you could spend a long time unpacking, drawing closer to more objective concepts, suggesting perhaps it is a subjective concept that is starting to be expanded to become objective. But one other useful thing, recently I was reading a book called The Bramble Bush by Carl Llewellyn. Some of you will know this book. Uh, Carl Llewellyn was a professor in the States who at the University of Columbia gave first year lectures. Um, they were obviously rather tough lectures, I think, having read this book, because The Bramble Bush is a, 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 basically a publication consisting of those introductory lectures. And apparently this book is still referred to in some US law schools to be read by first year law students. But in that book, Llewellyn said the following. He wasn't talking about unconscionability as such, but I think this actually identifies the problem with which I'm concerned. He said, legal use of technical words has sinned and does still in two respects. It is involved in ambiguity of two kinds, multiple senses of the same terms and terms too broad to be precise in application to details of single disputes. First, it does not use terms in single senses, but uses the same term in several senses and in several senses indiscriminately without awareness. This invites confusion. It makes bad logic almost inevitable. It makes statement of clear thought difficult. It makes clear thought itself improbable. And as lawyers, surely clear thought is what we should be seeking to encourage in others and in ourselves, And I think that's a, a really good summary of the problems relating to the failure to unpack what we mean by conscience and unconscionability. Now at this point, I think it is quite useful to give you a very brief history of conscience inequity. And this is where some of you are going to be squirming in your seats because this is a gross generalisation of a complex historical development, development of the law. But actually, 
I stand by this brief history. I think this does, in general terms, indicate how conscience has developed over time as an equitable notion. You can trace the language of conscience back to the Chancellor's conscience. The Lord Chancellor who received petitions from citizens in England and Wales who said we weren't happy with what the common law said. We want justice and we want the Lord Chancellor to provide justice in the individual case. And the Chancellor would determine what was just by reference to his, and of course it was always a he, conscience. And that of course sometimes was described as discretion or just simply the embodiment of justice. It appears to involve an individual moral judgment. That's what conscience means. But what is interesting, of course, is that the Lord Chancellors, and of course Thomas More was one of them, were um, ordained. There was a theological grounding to their interpretation of conscience. I think that might be significant, and I'll come back to that later. Later on, there is evidence that the language of conscience was used to refer to the testimony of witnesses. Witnesses and parties were only allowed to give testimony as to what was in their own knowledge. So the defendant might be testifying as to their conscience by reference to what they knew. Thirdly, Equity developed so that conscience referred specifically to the defendant's conscience, but as determined by the court. And this was very much a cathartic jurisdiction. The court actually saying, we are determining that this is what your conscience demands you should do. You should provide a remedy because conscience demands. And in the very famous Earl of Oxford's case, Lord Ellesmere said, the office of the Chancellor is to correct men's conscience. That's the cathartic jurisdiction. Moving into the 18th and partly 19th centuries, the language of conscience was simply used to describe equitable doctrine. Equity was the conscience jurisdiction. And fifthly, and this is my term, but I think we can bring the development of conscience up to date by reference to what I call the rhetorical conscience. And I actually regard Pitt and Holt as being a good example of that. A, a case where the language of conscience is used to justify a result, to justify equitable intervention, but it's actually a smokescreen because when you look behind it, there's nothing there. There's nothing you can really identify to determine what conscience actually means, other than the judge's own sense of what is fair and just. Now you might even say, having looked at that brief history, we've gone full circle. If, if you accept that notion of rhetorical conscience, isn't that rather like the Chancellor's conscience? This idea of an individual moral judgment. But you might say it's different, because at least the Chancellor's conscience purported to be founded on theological considerations, when certainly we don't purport to do that today. So that just shows you the complexity of the development of conscience. Now, in the paper which accompanies what I'm talking about, and this can be circulated to anybody who's interested, I spend a significant amount of time focusing on the different interpretations of conscience in quite often fairly contemporary judicial developments and analyses of the law, uh, both in England 
and to some extent in New Zealand with a bit of Australia as well. And in doing that, I identify four interpretations of conscience. The first is most definitely subjective conscience, specifically having regard to the defendant's mental state and using unconscionability as a form of mens rea. And we can actually see that in areas of law involving the creation of equitable proprietary rights and to some extent in the action for unconscionable receipt. I will say at this point, I could, and I'm really tempted to, to get really technical and get into the nitty gritty of equity. Some of you wouldn't be very interested, some of you would be really interested in that. I'm not going to. I'm just giving you a few broad headings to illustrate that how these different types of conscience are interpreted. But certainly, fault for unconscionable receipt can be interpreted in that subjective sense. There are cases involving objective conscience, again a fault element, but determined by reference to what the court considers the defendant's mental state should be, by reference to a reasonable standard, albeit having regard to facts known by the defendant. So the action for dishonest assistance illustrates that, and particularly, and a really interesting example of New Zealand and English law going hand in hand, at setting aside a contract for unconscionability, where an objective fault element relating to conscience is identified. Thirdly, I think there are cases where the language of conscience is used to refer to what the judges or the court's conscience demands, but reference to recognised principles. This isn't a smokescreen of conscience, it's actually a principled approach. And I think proprietary estoppel is a really good example of that. And then fourthly, there are plenty of examples of the court's conscience but being used as a rhetorical device, a smokescreen. I've already mentioned Pitt and Holt. And in England, at least, in the 1980s, we had a, a body of law developing where, in the context of illegality, where a transaction would be set aside because of the taint of illegality if the public conscience demanded it. Now, I, of course, there's a reference to the public, but the reality was it's the judge's conscience thinking that is the right result. But when you look at it, there are no principles underpinning it. That is rhetorical conscience. So there are four senses of conscience. Now, in a minute, I am going to suggest a new approach to conscience, what I call a new taxonomy of conscience. But to explain that, and maybe you've already got a hint of where my concern is with the interpretation of conscience, I do want to say something about judicial discretion, which is actually one of the other papers I've been delivering at um, the law schools I have been visiting, and I'm actually delivering one tomorrow at the law school here. So that there'll be much more detail in that, but just to give you an idea about judicial discretion. Discretion is used a great deal by the courts and by commentators. Is discretion a good thing or a bad thing? I have a sense, and I realise this is going to be a generalisation and rather stereotypical, but I have a sense, having taught a lot of New Zealand um, law students, met uh, New Zealand academics and judges as well, that you seem quite happy as a general rule with giving your judges discretion in this country. You have many statutes which specifically give judges discretion. I think in England we are much more concerned 
about giving our judges discretion. We don't trust our judges. Now, that's stereotypical generalisation, but I think there is a difference of approach. You seem happier with judicial discretion here. Interestingly, Thomas More, in Utopia, was really happy with discretion. He actually said this is his utopian ideal. The law and judges should avoid arcane interpretations and debates about law, but should instead judge the overall equity or justice of a situation and decide accordingly. So arguably in Utopia there are no law schools because there's nothing to discuss. You just let the judges get on and determine what equity or justice demands. In England, and of course he was writing in England, but in England there are other views. My favourite is a dictum of Lord Camden, admittedly delivered in 1795, but he said the discretion of the judge is the law of tyrants. It is always unknown. It is different in different men. It is casual and depends upon constitution, in temper and passion. In the best, it is oftentimes caprice. In the worst, it is very vice, folly and passion to which human nature is liable. Two views about discretion. Now I have to say, I actually share Lord Camden's view, or at least I did until I read an article which was published in 2013. And this is the point at which I start to get into some more jurisprudential territory out of my comfort zone. In 1956, Herbert Hart, the famous jurisprude, was at Harvard Law School and was talking to various people there about discretion. And various academics at Harvard said, why don't you present a short paper to the law faculty about discretion? And Hart did, and they obviously really liked it. But that paper was lost, not published, until 2013, when it was found and published in the Harvard Law Review. And Hart's paper, simply called Discretion, has had quite an influence on my own thinking, particularly relevant to this topic about conscience. Because Hart said, discretion is not a bad thing. The distinction is not rule versus discretion, which we would typically regard as the distinction. Actually, the real distinction is between rule, judges applying a clear rule, and arbitrary choice. It's arbitrary choice which is the bad thing, where a judge is just making a decision without any structure being provided by the law, without any identified reasonings with reference to principles. And it's that which judicial discretion is. Judicial discretion involves the judge evaluating the facts and the context, but making a decision by reference to recognised principles, so that the evaluation, judgement, can be defended. And when you analyse discretion like that, and realise it's really a choice between discretion and arbitrary choice, I think we can use that to create what I've called a new taxonomy of conscience. In my view, it is perfectly acceptable to use the language of conscience, and maybe we ought to replace the language of conscience because of unacceptable overtones. But I have no problem in saying it refers to the defendant's conscience. And then to say clearly, sometimes that will refer specifically 
to the defendant's state of mind, a subjective test of fault, and that will be exceptional inequity. But at other times to say the defendant's conscience refers to an objective assessment of the defendant's conduct in the light of the facts as the defendant knew them or believed them to be. That actually is how conscience as a state of mind is typically interpreted in equity. I would prefer to call that dishonesty, to distinguish it very clearly from the subjective state of mind. Again, in the paper accompanying this, I elaborate on that and it gets rather into some rather technical equity, but I'm perfectly happy with conscience in that state of mind sense. But crucially, if conscience is being referred to as the judge exercising conscience, or a reference to the court's conscience, it cannot be rhetorical conscience, because that is arbitrary choice. That does not involve the judge exercising discretion properly defined. Conscience, in terms of the court's conscience, has got to be principal discretion, Hartian discretion. And if we accept that, and we find the court referring to the language of conscience without identifying the principles that underpin the exercise of the judgment, it is unacceptable. In my view, that is what Lord Walker was doing in Pitt and Holt. And that, therefore, is a critical flaw in Lord Walker's analysis in that case. Now, I could go on in some detail about the implications of this analysis. I, in the paper, I talk about how it affects the determination of fault in equitable claims. I don't want to look at that now. Conscious of time, I just want to look at one particular application of what I'm talking about. And that is the role of conscience in the law of unjust enrichment. Now, the law of unjust enrichment is recognised in England and it is recognised in New Zealand. I am well aware that there are some people in this room who think it shouldn't be recognised either in England or in New Zealand, but it is. We can argue about whether it should, but it is. And it's interesting, looking at the law on unjust enrichment. The modern law of unjust enrichment, for those of you who don't know, essentially says that if you can establish that the defendant has been enriched at your expense in recognised circumstances that can be characterised as unjust, and that's not using unjust like unconscionable in a rhetorical sense, it is grounded on established categories, then restitution will follow. So if, for example, I pay money to you thinking I owe you that money, and I don't, you are liable to pay the value of that money back to me. You've been enriched by the money, you were enriched at my expense, and it was my mistake that caused me to pay the money to you incorrectly. And both in England and New Zealand, we would analyse that claim using the language of unjust enrichment. What is interesting is when you go back to the origins of unjust enrichment, and the language of unjust enrichment was not used then, but the origins at least of the law of restitution, where Lord Mansfield in the mid-18th century developed what has become the law of unjust enrichment. The language of conscience was specifically used. Restitution should be awarded because conscience demanded it. Sadler and Evans is one of the leading cases, and I've chosen that particularly because that was decided exactly 250 years ago, midway between utopia 
and today. So conscience is there, but today we don't use conscience very much in the context of unjust enrichment. Maybe that was being used in this rhetorical sense. Or maybe unjust enrichment is the principle underpinning conscience. And then the question is whether conscience is actually adding anything, and arguably it isn't, and it's actually a red herring which we should ignore. So that's the English approach. And as I say, that has really influenced what's happened in New Zealand as well. Australia is interesting. And I'm really grateful I'm standing in New Zealand uh, because of what I'm about to say. <laughs> Although I have said some of this in Australia myself. Australia has had a profound influence on the development of the modern law of unjust enrichment. Australia recognised, applied and developed unjust enrichment before we did in England. In the 1980s, the High Court had a profound influence on our thinking about unjust enrichment. But more recently, something odd has happened. Because of different membership of the High Court of Australia, and you can particularly identify it with certain personalities, unjust enrichment has been rejected. Most recently, in the Australian Financial Services and Hills Industries case, which said, we don't talk about unjust enrichment. The focus instead is on whether it is unconscionable for the defendant to retain the enrichment. And if it is, restitution should be awarded. It's all a matter of conscience. Now, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but there is a clear undertone from the Australian High Court saying, all this unjust enrichment stuff is, is what England has developed. And we're not going to have all this English stuff being imposed on us. We are going to have conscience. We are an equitable jurisdiction. Conscience is at the heart of restitution. Forgetting, perhaps, Conscience can be traced back to the English cases, and Australia developed the jurisprudence on unjust enrichment before England. So that's where we are in Australia. They've rejected unjust enrichment. It's a test of conscience. But which sense of conscience is it? Is it subjective fault? Well, in Hills, they said it's strict liability. So certainly not subjective fault, and certainly not objective fault either. So the choice is either it's the court's conscience in a principled sense or the court's conscience in this rhetorical sense. So what is the principle? Is there a principle underpinning conscience? And I've read Hill's Industries really carefully and I can't find one. There is no reference to any indication as to how you should determine whether restitution should be awarded. All we have in that case is a suggestion that um, there are legal principles, but they are grounded on equitable notions of good conscience. And there are equitable concepts available, but they're not identified. Now that suggests, perhaps, that Australia is doing something fundamentally different from what's going on in England and in New Zealand as well. But actually, I don't think they are. The Hills Industries case was essentially a mistaken payment case. It was slightly more complicated about a settlement made um, to settle a dispute on mistaken grounds. And actually, a lot of the discussion was about whether the defendant had changed its position, having been enriched. But if we treat it as a case involving money paid to a defendant by mistake, and the High Court accepted it would be unconscionable for the defendant to retain that enrichment, 
what would make it unconscionable? Surely it was the fact that the defendant had received money, had received that money from the claimant, and the claimant was mistaken. In other words, the only way you can give any sense to unconscionability is by reference to the component parts of unjust enrichment. I have no doubt that that case, if it was heard in New Zealand or in England, would be decided in the same way. Maybe some, some different interpretations of the defence of change of position, but the core response to restitutionary liability would be the same. And I think there's an important lesson there, that if we aren't careful and we fall into the trap of using conscience without identifying under the underpinning principles, it collapses into arbitrary choice. And that is no way to structure our private law. Now, there are other implications of my analysis relating to remedies, which I'm not going to look at now. But just to pull this together, what are my conclusions? I have no problem in distinguishing between the conscience of the defendant, using conscience to reflect fault, and the conscience of the court, as long as it, we are really clear that we are doing that and why. The conscience of the defendant can be a, a test of fault, which is usually assessed objectively, and I would wish to call that dishonesty to make it clear. Subjective assessment of fault is also exceptionally appropriate in equity, particularly to create proprietary rights. But crucially, it is legitimate to refer to conscience and unconscionability to refer to the conscience of the court or the judge, but only in a Hartian judicial discretion sense. It has got to be founded on clear principles to structure reasoning. Ultimately and fundamentally, the true role of conscience in contemporary equity reflects a battle over the nature of private law. And there is a spectrum of approaches that can be adopted. At one end, there is an idea of the pure logic of the law, which is founded on reason and predictability, where there is no role for conscience. At the other end, and this is a view I know reflected in many judgments and many judges like, is the desire to reach a just result on the facts, but maybe using conscience as a smokescreen to hide behind. I think Moore interpreted the role of equity in that way. My view is that the preferable approach falls somewhere between those two extremes principled justice, principled conscience is justifiable. Principled conscience has a legitimate role to play in contemporary equity, but only when the principles are identified. And I think Moore's utopia would be a complete disaster. I mean, I think in Moore's utopia, I wouldn't have a job because Moore's utopia actually doesn't involve law. The real utopia does involve law, but it does involve judicial discretion. It is nuanced, but it's principled. There is a legal structure, and it's that legal structure that we need to spend our time very carefully identifying and defending. Thank you. Now, I have said I'm really happy to answer any questions or receive any comments from you on that.
I can predict what a couple of the comments might be. Um, you may want to um, uh, not publicly raise a question or, or comment, but speak to me afterwards. I'm really happy to stay around for a bit uh, and talk to anybody who's got any comments on that. But are there any questions anybody would like to ask? Yes. Um, <coughs> thanks for the thought, Graham. It was um, really, uh, really interesting and um, insightful. And I have to say I agree with, I think I agree with almost everything you say, except one little thing. Oh, I just actually, there's two things. <laughs> one is, is it, it, this is just a little question, is it, isn't it true that you're actually, you have a reductive view of conscience in the sense that you don't really need it anymore. If you've got the principles, what do you need conscience for anymore, right? It's just the conscience is just the, the placeholder that once you've got the principles, it can disappear. So, well, okay, just that's on, on that, oh, okay. I, 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 I accept that completely. And that's really what I was saying with unjust enrichment. Well, I do, I do what, 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 what is conscience addict? And, and particularly the danger is, I mean, I, I don't mind for traditional reasons using it, but of course if we hide behind it and don't unpack it, it is dangerous. So, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Well, then I, there is a... <laughs> and that is, um, you, you focused on uh, equivocations in the use of the term conscience, and I, it's absolutely right that, that it needs to be done, no doubt. But I would say that there's also a problem with the use of the term discretion. <clears throat> and and I think Hart's just wrong uh, because he's he's not talking about discretion. He's talking about something else. He's talking about what if we weren't lawyers, we would just call judgment. Uh, let, let me just give you an example. Let's say I have a friend, and uh, it, it's a standard sort of philosopher's example that my friend has bought some really ugly shoes, and my friend's really happy, really proud of them, and asks me, "What do you think of what do you think of these shoes?" And I, I'm in a kind of dilemma here, right? What do I say? Do I say, God, oh, they're bloody idiots. Like, Jesus, what, they, what a moron you are buying. Or do I say, oh, they're lovely, they're fantastic. They're so I've got to try and think about what... Now, let's say I decide, look, what I've really got to do here is, as kind as I can, I've got to tell my friend that those shoes are horrible because she's going to go out in public and make a fool of herself. I've got to tell them. Okay, and I do that. Now, is that a, do I have a discretion? I come to the conclusion that there is a thing that I have to do. It's this. Right? It's not a discretion. I don't have a discretion. I, sure, I have to make, there are no rules here. It's not as if there are rules that can determine. I have to make a judgment in the light of the relevant principles. But it's not, it's not discretion. So I think you should keep your view about discretion and recognize that Hart's not talking about it. He's just using the wrong word. He's talking about judgment. And yet, okay. we need to make judgments about how to apply principles, and they're not applied automatically. So essentially what you're saying is that the arbitrary choice, a phrase he uses quite a lot in that paper, is actually what discretion is, and judgment is what he's calling discretion. So we could play around with the word. My immediate response to that problem was, of course, I preface my reference to discretion to judicial discretion. If there was a judge who was required in the case to, to say whether these shoes look good or not, the judge would uh, put all sentimentality out of the picture and say, well, they're rubbish. <laughs> don't, don't suit you. You don't get any damages, etc." <coughs> now, wh that, okay, whether that's discretion or judgment, we can talk about, but... Just because principles don't apply themselves doesn't mean that you have discretion in the application of principles. Okay. I think ultimately that may just be playing around, I mean, important, but playing around with the words. The, re the core of what I'm saying is, okay, well, let's call it judgment, it's got to be principled. And that's my real concern with quite a lot of private law where you actually delve down and the principles aren't there. Yeah. Thanks, Graham. I just wanted to, I wanted to question the premise that conscience is really at the heart of equity. Because if we think about it, conscience is, uh, equity is used to avoid paying taxes, as, we, as we've seen with the Panama Papers. And if you look at the history of equity, it's used to keep property from wives. Um, so it's not, I, I would like to question that conscience is really at the heart of equity. And if it is, I would like to hear your views on what role you think of it playing going forward. So is there a role, so if you think about the financial crisis and the deregulation of banking, is there a new role for equity going forward in terms of providing 
social justice. Okay. Uh, that's, a re re that's a big question and really interesting. What my immediate response is, and of course, within equity, w w th there's an awful lot of discussion about, yeah, is equity really about conscience? To answer that, you have to unpack conscience. Clearly, equity is a lot about spending time analysing fault and analysing what the just response should be. And true as well, there's an awful lot of equity uh, as applied rigidly which appears to work against what the just response might be. But I would say, and, and of course there are areas of the law you can throw against me, that increasingly I think there is a role for equity uh, in the commercial world, in the family law world, etc., to be used to do what it originally did, which is to say, here is the strict common law, we need to qualify it by reference to equitable principles. I mean, I'm certainly w we are seeing that in various jurisdictions as to what is being done for cohabiting couples and dealing with, with property rights. And actually, I was critical of Pitt and Holt. Pitt and Holt is essentially, well, there were two cases there which concerned tax avoidance. And in Pitt and Holt it, it, itself, poor uh, Mrs. Pitt, whose the money that was held on trust uh, was provided as damages for her seriously injured husband in an accident. She actually went to a solicitor saying, what do I do with this? And also the scheme was approved by the court of protection to say this is the best way of using the money and it all backfired. That seems to be an entirely appropriate way, a, a case where you unwind the transaction. Compare another case, which was Footer and Footer, which was one of these very, bi a bit like the Duke of Westminster, recently died and actually in, in England, not much inheritance tax is going to be paid because of discretionary trusts, where maybe we are having an abuse of the trust and there is a role for equity to say, we are not going to help you there. So, I, uh, there was, sorry? Uh, well, true, uh, um, but certainly there is a concern about manipulation of a, of a tax system using the tr and of course the trust is an equitable device. So I mean, there's an awful lot I could say in response to that. Um, I, I am actually increasingly confident that equity has a really important role over the next few years in dealing with some of the big commercial problems that we have. Now, we don't need to relate it to conscience. I'm happy to do so if we can identify the principles that underpin it. Th there are other questions. Shall we have one more? Peter, is that all right? Yes. Okay, yes. so, yeah. Fine. Um, in fact, I'm intrigued by the heart, uh, the newly discovered heart uh, article. I haven't read it. I have two questions about it, if you, if you can answer them. Um, in his debates with Long, in his debate with Long Thora, Hart spoke about the need for judges to exercise discretion in penumbral cases. But recently, Fuller, he was at pains to say that these judgments, discretionary judgments, might not be moral in nature. And he was at pains to emphasize that the judges might simply be trying to carry out the purpose of the statute that might be a bit amb ambiguous. Um, and to effectuate uh, the, the policy of the yeah. legislation. And that didn't need, as a conceptual matter, to involve any moral judgment at all. So my first question is, when he gave the lecture at Harvard regarding discretion, was he talking about discretion in the context of equity cases, or was he talking about discretion in the context of these penumbral cases that might not necessarily involve moral judgments? Okay. And the second question was, if he was talking about sort of equity cases, did he identify any principles uh, uh, that no. So, so really, this is me grabbing hold of an article and thinking I can use that to structure my thinking. He was not talking about equity cases. What is interesting as well, and there'll be people here who've read more about this than I have, this was a relatively early paper from Hart on discretion, and his thinking developed subsequently. Um, so I think that there is, there's, a, there's, there's more work to be done 
in tracing how his thinking perhaps changed. And certainly in the debates with Fuller, that, that appears to be perhaps at odds with my description of, of this particular paper. Um, I mean, what is very interesting from a, a US perspective, in the mid to late 1950s and early 60s, this was a really live issue about discretion, particularly in public administration, etc. And, and I think it, it, it flowed into some of those discussions as well. Um, so I don't think, you, certainly you, you can't say, oh, he's just talking about equity. He wasn't. But he wasn't really engaging with the fuller debate at that point. I think this was just thoughts about what do we mean by discretion. Graham, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, that was, I think, an extremely compelling lecture. A provocative one in the very nicest way possible. <laughs> Greatly admired, and he, before you all came in, he said, um, what I'm thinking of doing is speaking for 45, 50 minutes and then inviting questions. I sort of looked at and said, how are you? Um, he said, yes, I'm quite happy to do that. And I thought that was quite commendable, being willing to front up in the way that he has. It's quite exceptional. Um, so often we go to excellent presentations, but they end immediately when the presentation ends. I thought excellent the way that there was a willingness here to engage. I thought that was superb. Anyway, um, this is just the formal vote of thanks. I thought this is an extremely engaging lecture. And I think we were all quite riveted. Uh, we are in his debt, and I suggest that we signify our thanks in the usual way.